All right, and welcome back after that tea break. It is the second day of the Africa CIO 100 Symposium and Awards. I hope you've enjoyed your tea break as we wait for the rest of the participants to come in. We will just kick off with the next part of the program. And this is a very special one because Safaricom Business has decided to launch this series, and that is the Guru Series being a monthly series that will be seen as to bring conversations from technology gurus, driving through thought leadership engagements and providing a deep understanding of how our enterprise solutions shape technology companies. Now for today, you'll need to tune in and have this conversation and it is understanding how technology is emerging to help companies to provide a better customer experience. And I have a panel of heavy hitters here, and they are all representing various institutions. But more importantly, Safaricom is a very big thank you to Safaricom. And this will be driven, or rather the conversation will be driven by Ellie Mathenge. And she will be conversating with Chris Senano, Chief Enterprise Business Safaricom. Chris, of course, accompanied by Rose Muturi, Managing Director, East Africa Branch International. John Kamara, Founder and CEO Afia Record and Other Labs with Jane Moy, Chief Information Officer, Standard Chartered Bank. Over to you, Ellie. Thank you. I really appreciate. You all feeling all right? Grab yourself a cup of coffee. Okay. Today I ask you to listen, to understand. And at the end of it, I'll have, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. So my name is Ellie Mathenge. I have the pleasure of running this series together with Chris. So Chris... Um, I'm going to ask you to um, share briefly about the Guru series. But before we start, I would love us to trend, even if it's briefly, tag at CIO Africa, tag at Safaricom Business Guru Series, and at Safaricom PLC. So hashtag at Safaricom Business Guru Series, at Safaricom PLC. Got that? All right. Can we have this session trending? And you can tag me to yours truly at Eli Mathenge. Super. So one more time, I will introduce our panelists and in no particular order. So our host, Chief Business uh, Enterprise Officer at Safaricom. Can you give him a nice Mombasa welcome? Right next to me, Rose Moturi, Managing Director, East Africa at Branch International. John Kamara, Founder and CEO, Afia Record, and he's also an AI and machine learning expert, right there at the end. Saving the best for last, Jane Mwai, CIO, Standard Chattered. All right, so let's kick off our session. Chris, explain to us what the Guru Series is and what you intend to achieve with this series. Thank you, Ellie. Um, uh, Guru Series is um, a platform. It's a new platform that we've launched as Safaricom Business. Um, the idea is that uh, once a month, we bring in a guru, like the people sitting to my left and right, and they come and talk to us about how technology is impacting their company or their industry. And the idea is uh, for us to learn um, from these gurus, both internally as Safaricom and also externally our clients. And so it's been a live series. Um, this is the third one we're having. And very excited to be um, launching it here in Mombasa um, together with CIO in the company of real gurus. Thank I you. agree. I agree. Fantastic. So we're streaming live. So for those people who are sitting behind their laptops, feel free to tag us along. And all our panelists, all of them have Twitter handles, so kindly find them. All right. So let's get into the, the meat of this conversation. So new intelligent technologies can be useful, right, at enhancing but not replacing the human face. And I know enterprises are turning towards the use of technologies to enhance customer experience. So this is to you, Chris. Talk to us briefly about customer experience and how it has evolved in the past years. So I, I think the key, one of the key things that has happened in the last 10 years is that the expectation of clients is, has changed. 
Um, a lot of this has to do with digitization. And obviously, the last two years, um, having all been stuck somehow either at home or confined spaces, um, companies have either risen up to the challenge and changed their user interfaces in a way that clients find it easier to engage with them, or those companies have other, I mean, companies have had to step back. Ultimately, um, customer experience or superior customer experience comes from the ability to give your clients a very convenient and easy way to engage with you. Whether it is to buy your products or to complain about your service or to get an upgrade or just normal interactions. So ultimately, uh, the companies that take advantage of digitization or digital interactions to engage their clients are the, clients, are the companies that are going to come on top of the list in terms of great and superior customer service. Okay. So that's a good segue for you, Jane. In a very competitive market where digitization is at forefront, um, and the banking industry has to stay on top of these emerging technologies. So explain to us how these new technologies, and feel free to tell us which technologies they are, are impacting your products, your services, and how you are interacting with this customer whose expectations have changed. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Um, before George left the stage, he talked about um, customers being king and everything nowadays is being curated for the customer. Obviously, that translates everywhere we are. So even in the banking space, we've got to think about who are our customers and what do they want. Um, if I take Standard Chartered, for example, uh, we launched a digital bank about two years ago. Um, and what we've seen is that literally 95 or so percent of our customer acquisitions are happening through this channel. We've also seen that um, our age profile has gone down to an average age of about 35. And you know what that means. These are digital natives. So they want things like this. Um, so we've also had to change our products and things that we offer to then meet this particular group. So we have deployed a lot of uh, machine learning, AI. Uh, we have APIs with third parties as well just to make sure that we can have the products that our customers want. If, if you look at what happened in the last year, um, last year when we, when we went into COVID and everything accelerated, everybody then moved online. The sellers moved online, the buyers moved online, and of course the banks had to move online. Um, and then you have the different timings that people do things. Not everybody uh, wants to go to, not everybody wants to bank between eight and five. People are banking outside of the normal hours, which then means you've got to make sure that everything is available as well. Uh, so you've seen um, in our bank, not on the customer side yet, we don't have the chatbots, but on the corporate side, we do have chatbots. So that our customers can, you know, if they're doing a transaction or they want to know something, even if it's late into the night, they can still get the kind of information that they want. So we've, we've seen a lot of that happening, and I've seen it in the other banks as well. Um, a lot of other banks have the WhatsApp banking, Facebook banking. We're banking everywhere now. So mm -hmm. we've gone to meet the clients where they are and meet them at their needs, as well as meet them how they want to be met, because not everyone wants to come into a branch. We are now digital natives. I like that. And I can only imagine this is transitioning everywhere. So John, um, I find your work quite intriguing. And as you work towards enhancing patient experience, so are you using the same technologies that Jane talked about, AI, machine learning, to rev revolutionize patient customer experience? Right. But if I would ask you a question, where is your healthcare system? Right now, take that one. Don't think about where it is. <laughs> Nobody. And that is the most important data to mm -hmm. not even your financial data. Your health data is the most you, you don't have access to it. So technology has been able to allow us to bridge that gap. So what we're trying to do is create a situation where when I ask you that question, you can go on your phone and you say, this is my healthcare data from the last hospital that I was in. This is what happened to me. This is what I'm doing with my doctor. And when I go to the next 
next person, I can also then provide that information as a wrapped object. It's basically you're just gonna use a cost of healthcare avoid and also you, you can create an efficient patient. And it's called a patient-driven ecosystem. So healthcare has to turn to the patient. The same way banking changed for the customer, it's not about the hospital or the doctors, it's about the patient because the patient, ultimately, everybody's a patient first. Even if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, whatever you are, you're a patient first. And the day you get sick doesn't mean you realize. So technology during this COVID period has been able to allow traditional institutions to see the fact that if you don't put the patient at the centerpiece of healthcare, the cost of healthcare, the service of healthcare will never change and will continue. So we, we basically first take the first step, which is really how do we use the technology to marry healthcare and treatment? Treatment happens in the hospital, healthcare happens outside the hospital. Technology helps us to bridge that gap. So is government playing a critical role in ensuring me, my data is protected and Jane doesn't have a version of it, Rose doesn't have a version of it? I mean, that's also, a, that's another whole conversation around <laughs> data. But the first thing is, do you have access, first of all? And what government does, you should do, is make sure that the access you have is protected by right of the state. Now, who else has access to it is dependent on a number of different types of things. Then you talk about governance, and then you talk about privacy, and you talk about accessibility. So all these are different spheres. But what we look at, first of all, is access. Can I have access to my, can government make it possible for me to have, if I live in Isiolo in a small little village and I go to Mombasa the next day, can that hospital or can I be the one? Because the only possible person, I am moving around nonstop. Right. I mean, I think the, the real key issue over there is the portability of the data, the health data, such that if you move from one clinic to another, you can, the doctor in the other one mm -hmm. can have access to the information that the previous one did and just to ensure that as, as a digital citizen, mm -hmm. I can move mm -hmm. with my, I, I don't have to go back to this particular hospital because that's where my records are. I think really, from a digital point of view, that's really where we are. There's work. Yeah, exactly. yeah there's exactly. work. I feel vulnerable as a patient and I can only imagine the person who's layman down there, how they would feel. But that's, leads us to a good question when it comes to access, financing, and lending. Um, I'm in Isiolo, I'm in a jam, and I want money. So branch shows up, you know, it's available. So how do you effectively make lending decisions? So you must, I want to assume you are using some type of technology to access my credit to see if I'm viable. How do you do that? and have a quick turnaround so that me sitting in Isiolo can get treatment fast because I need the funds. So explain to us in a nice layman way <laughs> the process and how these technologies have improved your process and turnaround times when it comes to issuing out these loans. Great, so uh, for Branch International, what we say is um, we use data science with a social conscience. So essentially, we've been in business for over six years now. So in Kenya, in Nigeria, in India. <clears throat> and based on the fact that we tell the customer that they can download the application and give us some rights to access some data, we're able to disperse the loan to them in under three minutes. So essentially, the, the use of artificial intelligence is very key to us. We do a, a lot of machine learning as well. And that, what that helps us do is to get a lot of information and it's all anonymized, so there's no human being seated somewhere trying to understand what does it, this data mean. And we actually had done an experiment so that I can answer your question, where we put a few individuals in a room and we gave them some anonymized data and we told them, if you got this kind of information, would you approve this loan or would you not? And no single individual had the same response as the other. So the fact that we use machine learning and we use artificial intelligence removes all the bias. And um, interestingly, the person who was least biased is the one who, um, you'd say happy-go-lucky, the one who has no judgments or you know, which church do you go to or what do you do on a Friday night, they didn't care. So when we were looking at who had the best score, if you will, when they were coming to, to judge the applicants, and she was quite young, she actually came out with the highest score because she didn't have any 
you know, like if you worked in credit for such a long time, you mm. form your own biases about a customer. She didn't have it. She was quite, um, she was just over 18. And she said, well, I think this person can pay. I think this other one can pay. And when we actually went and approved those loans based on the feedback that we got, she, she got a high score. So to eliminate all these biases, we use um, a lot of data. Um, everything is all automated. There's no single person who works on the information. And uh, going back to what John has said, um, who owns the data in terms of your medical records, I think um, you ask yourself, if I had possession of that data as a patient and I'm keeping it on my phone, who else will get access to that information? So it, it, it actually brings another conversation to that. But how do we end up lending or how do we end up uh, giving the individual the loan? Um, once they ac accept our terms and conditions for us to access the data, and it's completely um, public information on our website, we tell you which data sets we're going to be accessing, uh, whether it's going to be the GPS data because we are, we are primarily on Android so that we can be able to see which location you're at, um, which type of SMSs are we, be, are we going to be able to access and things like that. Um, we are able to automatically crunch the data and uh, disperse the loan to you. So how has this morphed over the few years that we've been in business? So you find there's a reason why six years later we're still doing what we're doing. We're still growing as a business. We're still expanding into various markets. And just the fact that the, the way we've trained the system, the way we've trained the data, we are easily able to launch into a brand new market because there's a lot of information that you get at one single instance and you can be able to derive a lot of decisions from it. And you don't have a lot of capital, uh, it's not capital intensive, because today if I look at the credit team and the data science team across the globe, we have at least 12 people uh, who are dispersing over $13 million a month. And if that was someone going through paperwork, you would need a whole lot of people. So the use of technology has helped us to, to be able to churn out volumes in different countries. Our credit team works off of, for instance, today the credit person working in Kenya is actually able to use data for India, is able to use data for Nigeria as an example. So we don't necessarily say, because they sit in Kenya, you'll only work on Kenya type of, um, of data. You can actually be able to work on any. So that's how we're using, we're leveraging on technology. I'm really trying to keep myself from asking you data-related questions, but uh, like you said, a conversation for another day. So then this leads me to Jane with your very highly regulated industry. And I'm sitting there thinking every time I go to a bank and someone is judging me because of my last name, someone is judging me because of the address in which I put on the banking application, how are you using these emerging technologies to overcome some of these regulatory compliance issues that are making you guys being left behind. I don't know how else to put that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. We do live um, in a very highly regulated industry. Um, but obviously, we do work with our regulators just to make sure that we are all um, keeping on up and up. But the one thing that you find with these technologies is that it does also help the regulators. Because you have, um, of course, you know, money laundry is a big thing, uh, terrorist financing, and, and mm -hmm. so on. And this technology does help us know what's going on real time. There's a lot of data that's flowing through. And having um, algorithms that will then run through the data and pick up pointers that will say, OK, Ellie, Ellie's doing something that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. So then we can now dig a little deeper into what Ellie's doing. But if you can imagine, if we didn't have that, this would all be done retrospectively. So we'd be finding out six months later that actually Ellie was doing something wrong. Whereas today, because of um, having all the algorithms in place and you set up all sorts of rules, you can then tell on the spot as you look through uh, um, Ellie's transactions that there's something going on. So that's how technology has helped. Um, same thing with account opening. I told you we open our accounts 95% um, of our accounts are opened online. And again, you can't do that um, if you follow the traditional way of somebody comes in, fills out a form, gives you the ID, you photocopy, you go and look somewhere for this ID. Today, we're doing all this digitally. So you'll take a selfie, um, we have your ID, we'll go to IPRS, 
all through technology. Mm. So within literally seconds, you have an account and you can start transacting on that account. So that, and that helps also with the government because now there's a whole thing around KYC. So you can say, yes, this is Ellie and this is her ID number and this is her PIN and, and so on. Um, and having the, the interactions with, with the regulatory bodies obviously does help um, because they are also opening up APIs so that we can trade information with them. So we're, we're working together in this heavily regulated industry. Um, there's still more we can do. I think we've seen some of our neighbors talking about um, cryptocurrency. Nigeria <laughs> just launched the <laughs> era. Um, so yeah, so, so we still have a ways to go with how technology can then move to the next level. Um, within within Kenya, can, can I throw? A Absolutely, can, can I, throw I a know. A I am yeah, with you. Go ahead, ahead, Chris. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> so, 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 Jane, it's true. Most banks are now giving us ninety-five percent to do the stuff offline. But can I throw a challenge that after we've done all that, we don't have to go to the branch to collect the password, or is it the card? You know, that last bit, why can't you just send it to us using drones or something like that? <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. Oh, can Standard Chartered be the first? We're actually it? able to do that well, in Nigeria, okay. so we're, we're I can, I can jump in. <laughs> the G4S. But, but we will get to the stage where you can use a digital card. But, you know, we've got to work with the regulators to allow some of these things. <laughs> so it's a regulatory <laughs> issue. Okay, it's <laughs> our. <laughs> but in their defense, I think they're trying the digital app part of opening an account, I think, is quite um, innovative. And you said within minutes, so you beat um, Branch in their three minutes of scoring you on credit, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, super. All right. Um, I think technology is so interesting. You can always keep talking about it, and it can keep veering off, but I want us to keep on course. So, Chris, Safaricom came, then they brought M-Pesa. Our lives changed. And now we get to see a homegrown organization evolve. So how is Safaricom playing in this space? Number one, to improve service to delivery and helping customers um, digitize. So um, I think the first 10 years of Safaricom was based on pushing out uh, a lot of voice communication. That's what we needed. Um, you're looking at 2000 to 2010. Uh, 2010 was the launch of M-Pesa, and obviously M-Pesa has revolutionized most of our lives. These next 10 years, we see ourselves moving from being a telco to being a techno company. What does that mean in English? It means that we want to help using uh, M-Pesa and our network. Um, we want to help end users and SMEs specifically to leverage that platform to do their businesses. So we're talking about access to market, access to finance, mm -hmm. um, and what I was talking about before, the digital interactions. Specifically on Safaricom business, one of the things we're doing is having conversations with our clients to see how we can help them um, digitize their front end. So more of a B2B2C um, type of interaction. And I'm sure most of you have heard of the m uh, super app our business app. Mm -hmm. Those are platforms that we are offering to different verticals to put their businesses over there. M-Pesa um, has over 30 million people using it uh, all over the world. And so therefore, that obviously is a platform that can be used um, for, for a good experience. Um, we're preaching the message of digitization. Obviously, the more we do, the more the banks also do. Um, I, in some of the chat forums, there's or always... The, or the more we do, <laughs> the more you do, the, the, more, the more we do. But ulti ultimately, together, we're building an ecosystem which says, um, let's give convenience to the end user, let's help them uh, digitize their own business, and let's uh, find a way of using these platforms to the benefit of everybody. Super. If I can just add on to what Chris has said, um, we do have to work together. I mean, we all have to work in tandem. I, a few years ago, we probably looked like competitors. There was Mpesa on one side, and then there was the banks. Um, but we've, we've all got to work together uh, with fintechs as well, with the regulators, mm -hmm. with the telcos, with the medical fleet, everywhere. Because 
our customers, they, they, they're all about experience, uh, how, how, how it feels, right? It's not about, I am just going to go to Safaricom. They will go wherever they feel the experience is good. Mm. Okay. So if we all then work together, we can then now make it a better experience for the people who are out there who want to use or pick up our products or use our services. Yeah, can I just say something here? So, I mean, I think what year did you enter sir? 2010. 2010, this is about 11 years ago. Uh, you took a leap of faith and you jumped into this interesting technology space. Do you think in the past 10 years you've actually taken a, another leap of faith anyway? Forget a super app, but like in real technology. Do you think the American was taking a leap of faith into the next as a leader to say, okay, we're not going to push the boundaries of technology? Yeah. Not a super application. I, I mean, it depends on what you mean by leap of faith. Going into Ethiopia is a leap of faith. So that is a massive leap of faith because you came from nowhere to build something that nobody could. <laughs> now, there are all these new forms of technology as well that could really leapfrog what mm -hmm. we're talking about digitization. Maybe when you ask me the next question, digitization is, yes, it's good, but it's not really the ultimate form of what we're doing in technology. And in Africa, where we have the opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world, um, so do you think that embracing new forms of technology, Safaricom has actually pushed itself to do that? So, so yes, definitely. I mean, the session before Laura's had um, our CIO, George and Alan, and I think one of the things that definitely is being done, we're, we're doing a lot with AI. We may not be screaming about it, but um, we, in, since January to date, we've hired over 700 developers. And the reason for that is actually to bring, to build an ecosystem um, working on different types of technologies to ensure that we keep ourselves A, abreast, and B, ahead of the curve. Um, I may not be, because we're a public company at Liberty, to tell you all the secrets that we're cooking up, but all I can say is just watch this space. Fantastic. I think any organization in technology has to always continuously be thinking again, lest you become a Blackberry that just didn't think through. Um, and it makes me just, you know, go back to your point, Jane, where we have to coexist. There needs to be a Safaricom and there needs to be a regulator and there needs to be the banks who react to whatever other organizations are doing. So I think there's space to coexist and there's always space for trailblazers. So um, you've answered my question about digital transformation. So I want to go back to you, um, John, um, in regards to the robotic process automation. And I think all of us, when we hear robots, we go into a sci-fi kind of space, you know. Yet on your phone, you're constantly interacting with your phone and it has artificial intelligence on it. So how is... RPA changing the process of engineering, and what impact does it have on customer experience? Um, I think RPA, which I'm sure most people know, um, basically allows you to get things done faster. I like to explain things in a simpler way. Um, it helps you to go from point A to point B actually really quick. And across multiple industries, especially financial services, for example, in Treasury, using RPA, people can actually process information quicker and faster, but also get the same end result. Uh, if you look at ATMs now, that are able to do multi-layer RPA solutions as well. Again, you can go from treasury to ATM, to the customer getting his money, and that is also robotic process automation. So everything from all that paper that you carried around in the treasury, in the finance department, all those things. And even if you look at it in industry as well, the same thing as well is happening. So. Is it, is it making people's lives easier and better? Yeah. It's a, sometimes a customer doesn't really know what is happening behind the scenes, but you know, when you look at process automation, so many companies are adopting it across the world right now, and mo mainly a lot of financial service companies who deal with so many heavy moving paperwork and who deal with a lot of calculation when it comes to how they have to repurpose their finances and how to do audits, all these things. So they basically run even multi layers of process automation which automates and checks the RPA as well, so that you have you know, zero tolerance for error. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I think the, the, the places that you really want to go is things like you know, um, zero knowledge encryption. 
you know, that's where you want to go because that's really where you're talking about nobody can have access to your data apart from yourself. You know, when you start going into creating secure IDs that are based in multilateral units in part, you know, where you then say, okay, that data that I had, especially in healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just enough to digitize healthcare data because anybody can still hack that data. You know, so why don't you put that data on the blockchain? Why don't you put that data somewhere where it's immutable, somewhere where it can't be tampered with, somewhere where you can't, nobody can transfer that information and be encrypted with zero encryption? You know, when you're able to do things like that, then you're saying, okay, well, you've gone from where we are now, where we have the ability to digitize, but if we digitize with new technologies in mind, compared to places in Europe where because they digitize, the cost of doing all these forms of new technology becomes so expensive. Uh, so the opportunity to really take hold of super smart technology and add it to the digitization process is where I think it's really exciting when you talk about new technology. You know, because you finish digitization, you're still gonna go back and now try to add new forms of technology <laughs> on top of it. Mm. So why don't we have the op opportunity to do it in, you know, in one stretch? So um, RPA, really exciting, but you know, it's stuff that a lot of institutions are doing right now and it's helping them, but you know, what for me, what I'd like to see is institutions who take it one step and say, okay, look, how do we really, really encrypt data? How do we go to zero level cryptography in the information? How, do we, how are we able to use that same information when we analyze the data to create blocks that allow us to actually make that data completely untamperable? So those are the things that, especially in financial services as well, you know, those are the things that I feel that we have the opportunity to, in Africa to do without necessarily looking at the rest of the world and saying what are they doing? You know, we, we are, we're digitally transforming ourselves. I just came from Zambia. All I had was digital transformation. Mm. So if we have the opportunity to go from zero to 10, why not go to 100? So I have a question on that. <laughs> so. I like the fact that you're talking about encryption even to the individual level as an example. So if you look at the at Africa and some of the challenges we may face where we have what you call institutional voids. So the, the towns or the major cities will have connection to electricity or whatever else you may need. But the far flung out areas you find, those basic things will not be there. So if you're talking about let's encrypt to the lowest level, I'll give an example of when Safaricom started M-Pesa, and it, it just sounded like this weird thing where money is going to fly in the air, and no one understood what we were trying to say. They had to, again, train us on this is what we literally are saying. What do you think is the challenge you're facing today? Is it the fact that, even for me, as a, let me say I'm a layman, you're telling me to encrypt my information. I, I go crazy when I don't remember passwords, so I put one for... <laughs> now we know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm going to give you my password later. But so what does that mean for that person who is not necessarily interested in being tech savvy? They just want protection. They, just, they don't want anything extraordinary. For that person, they don't really know the difference. <laughs> they just know that. So are we um, saying we don't care about them? <laughs> Either it's in the village or in the city, it's the same level of work. If you're going to digitize either from scratch on paper or from semi-digitization or whatever you want to do. So at the end of the day, when you provide the person that service and you tell them their data is secure, they, they, they don't necessarily are worried about how secure their data is today. Mm -hmm. Today. But tomorrow, once they begin to understand the value of that level of encryption that you put on their data, then it becomes light bulb moment for them. But you've done it today anyway, and they still access the service the same way they do, maybe on the USSD. They don't, it doesn't matter to them. The service is still the same experience, but what you've done behind the scene gives you save time and money that you have to use next time to do the same thing. So that's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't care about them, but we can still help them. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is, um, you do make an interesting point around the technologies, and I guess being where we are here in Africa, the biggest challenge is getting our regulators to move at the same pace that we would want to move at. So if we're talking blockchain, then everybody needs to say, yes, blockchain is where we go. Um, because if you can say, here, I want to do blockchain, and then I go to CBK and they say no. Um, or I go to IRA and they say no. 
so <laughs> that sort of kills that right there. Um, but you're right, we've got to use uh, or think of um, leapfrogging and go from zero to 100 and not zero to 10%, as you said. But we have to make sure we carry everybody along with us, um, which means the, the regulators have to be with us, um, the financial institutions have to see that it makes sense, the ministries have to see that it makes sense, because today you'll say you want to digitize, um, I, I think it was, I, I recall the late uh, Fernando talking about blockchain and how that could be used in the insurance agent, uh, industry. And I remember his comment was somebody would insure his big um, Range Rover in like five different insurance companies, have an accident and collect from all five. Yeah, so he gets back the cost of his car and he can buy another three. Um, <laughs> so at the time, and that was, uh, it was a few years, a few, a few years ago. Yep. And he was saying at the time, these are the case studies that we need for blockchain. And even now we are still talking about it, we don't have it. So how then do we get from this, from this place where we are here talking and actually making these things happen? And how do we carry everybody along with us so that we are all on the same page as far as this is concerned, because yes, these are great technologies and they do make a hell of a difference. So how do we make sure we are all together on it? I think that's the bigger challenge. And I think I said it to you earlier, um, if there was no effort of a Safaricom way back, we would have not had an Impesa. There has to be someone who's a trailblazer, who's willing to push those doors so that these technologies can then happen. Otherwise, there'll be stories we'll be talking about that in 2020, there was AI that could stop people insuring their cars in 10 companies. I think it has to be a deliberate effort in each industry that there's someone pushing those doors. And maybe it's the same companies that keep repeating it. You know, once you're bold once, you can be bolder and bolder and bolder and open those doors. So I don't see why the banking industry couldn't go back to some of these regulators and say, hey, we have products for insurance. We want to push this. How do we work together? They already are listening to you. And so before I, I turn on the questions to the audience, I wanted to talk to you about, and I, I can imagine can open a whole uh, Pandora's box in terms of identity theft. So I, you know, get someone's phone, I find they have a Tala app, whatever, or I even have details. You know how every time you walk into a building and you're told to sign your ID, right? And I have all those details and I use those details to open an account with branch. How do you verify it's actually me? Mm -hmm. And have you, I'm certain you've probably seen instances where there's two people claiming to be the same. And one of them is saying, no, that's not me. Yeah. So actually a very good question. And um, essentially what we do, and that's the beauty actually of artificial intelligence, there are some patterns that you can already detect when it comes to fraud. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll find just based on doing this over the years, based on collecting um, a lot of data over the years, you can quickly predict how a particular behavior is going to be. Mm -hmm. So by the time someone is downloading the app and going through the motions to the point where we are able to disperse that, uh, the three minutes, if you're a repeat user, of course, it's um, instantaneous, we are able to identify the flags that we have modeled within the fraud type of um, segment. So this actually happens across all the countries. So in Kenya, we're happy that there are databases that you can plug into the national ID repository. But when you go to places like, for instance, in Tanzania, various types of IDs are accepted. So with that in mind, you allow the customer in, but you have another layer of checking what other flags will this person exhibit to show that they are tending towards fraud. So this is how we look at it. We don't necessarily say that just because you raised a plug or two, you're automatically a fraudster, because it could be coincidental. But due to the fact that it is not a human being assessing those data points, you find the robot will actually give uh, what you call the confidence level to say at 90% we believe, or at 90% this particular user is good to go. And you find it goes through a very, very small manual uh, process where if, for instance, the individual had a different name from what they've registered with, our contact center will be able to chat with them because we don't do phone calls. Um, and that's because of the age group that you deal with. They're, they're better off chatting with us. And we tell them, this is what we're facing. We need you to provide something or the other. And that's done. It takes a very short time. And that is usually for a very, very small percentage. 
For the rest, we've uh, been able to model across all the different countries, how does fraud look like, what should we look out for, and we can safely say that we are able to protect the users. Um, the cases we used to have, I would say maybe four years back of um, phone theft um, and someone else applies for a loan have materially declined. Mm -hmm. And thanks also to um, that new feature that Safaricom came up with where if someone goes to register for another line using your ID, you'll be notified. Oh, that super. actually has made a big difference. So that's why we collaborate and partner with them because the symbiotic relationship helps. We know for sure as they prevent fraud on their side, they're helping us also to prevent fraud on our side. So it works out for the best. Power of partnership and the amazing work that technology can do. All right, clap for them. They've done an amazing job educating you. And earlier I said, I hope you were listening to understand. Now this is the time to use what you understood to ask some <laughs> questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question for, for Rose. Uh, I've, just, I've just downloaded the Standard Chartered application and I'm actually going through the process. I'm able to take an image of my ID. Uh, by the way, my name is Mandeep. I, I'm a business development manager for Aquant. We're a digital identity verification provider that works globally. Um, I love what Standard Chartered are doing. Uh, clearly, they're taking an image of an ID. I think the next step will be I'll take a selfie. So this is more a question for Rose. Why don't you do the same? And that's a good way of, of doing it. You know, you, you're checking IPRS, but everyone has a smartphone and they're, they're doing a loan application, they have an ID, and you can do a selfie check. Why, why use AI mm -hmm. when you can compare that? Uh, the banks are doing it uh, globally around the world. Um, why isn't branch? Uh, same question for Chris as well. Um, I was speaking to a South African friend, and he says it's, it's, it takes a long time to get an M-Pesa account pay bill. Why <laughs> can we not make it any faster? I'll stop there. Those are great questions. Okay. Over to you. All right. So the reason why we are not using um, selfies for now is, I wouldn't say it's intentional, but it's because of how we were acquiring the users from the beginning. and. The fact that we are able to confidently identify the customer, we did not want to include a, another barrier where we tell you to take a photo of anything. So here is an example. When you look at Tanzania and the fact that they are able to use various types of IDs, and we would tell them, hey, send a photo of this or show us a particular image, the, the user experience was really poor. And we said, as opposed to make a customer jump through hoops in order for them to give them, in order for us to give them a loan, yet we are able to confidently identify who they are. We're going to leverage on our data science and on our expertise. Now, because we're in the process of um, becoming um, a neobank Pan-African across the, um, the continent, you'll find some, uh, for instance, like in Nigeria, they do have a different um, level of acquiring the KYC information due to the fact that they offer versatile products like they can take deposits, they can give investment services through the branch app. And for Kenya, when we get to that level, definitely we will need to increase the level of KYC, um, at least according to the regulator. But that's just purely the reason. We didn't want to add more hoops for the customer to jump. Mm. Yeah. Chris. <laughs> 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 it depends. <laughs> you don't know, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Look, most of, most of the systems are now automated. Um, I think in the past it did used to take uh, quite a while, while, specifically on the pay bills. You, you need to understand that just like the banks, uh, pay bills, we need to be sure that we're not allowing people to fund terrorism and stuff like that. Mm. And so there's, there's always an extra check that we have to do. Um, I can tell you that most of our systems have moved on to self-service now, and because of the digital stuff that we're doing, I would say 48 hours, um, but if you want it to be 24, see me when I walk off the stage, <laughs> I'll sort you out. 
you have witnesses. So anyone else asking a question, kindly introduce yourself and maybe the organization you work for and then proceed with your question. All right, right there. Right, uh, my name is Pauline from Unga Group. I have two questions. Uh, one, I think I'll address Jane Y. Um, okay, in my opinion, I think uh, private sector is moving faster than the government in terms of innovations and technology. And uh, we, f uh, we find that what that happens is that we are being derailed behind. So um, what, what are we doing as the stakeholders in ensuring that the government is um, moving at the same pace as us that is if my opinion is true. You can help us on that. And then my second question is to Chris on uh, m -Pesa customer. If I want to be just uh, an m -Pesa customer for your online services and not a voice and SMS, can I register at the comfort of my couch? Thank you. You know, you've asked a very difficult question that I'm not so sure I can answer, um, not really being a spokesperson for the industry. Um, but I, I think what we, what, what we need to do as private sector um, to make sure that we do take everybody along with us is to make sure we have a lot more of these kinds of sessions and invite the stakeholders that we need to invite to participate in these sessions so that we are all sort of having the same kinds of conversations. One of the things I've seen in, in I think, some of the government or the, regulator, uh, the regulators is that they do give a lot of training to their staff. So there are probably people there who are trained on blockchain, crypto, all those things, but they have the knowledge and maybe nothing much is happening with it. But if we're all sitting here and we're all talking about it, and I'm sitting next to somebody from the Ministry of Finance, and I'm saying, you know, crypto is the way to go, and they'll be trained on crypto, and we start having these conversations, then it becomes something that rolls and, and becomes something bigger. Um, but I think it's, we, we do need to engage um, with our regulators and with the government, and keep having conversations around what it is that we wanna do. So for the banking industry, um, for example, we need to be engaging a lot more with our regulator and telling our regulator, this is, this is what we want to do, this is how we see it, how do you guys see it, what do you think, can we, do this? can we do it this way, can we do it that way? The same for the people who are here in the insurance industry. Have those conversations with your regulators. And I think if we have a lot more conversations and a lot more of these kinds of engagements, then I think we can start to see a lot happening. Um, I, I don't want to comment on the fact that we are ahead of them <laughs> or, or they are ahead of us. <laughs> I'll leave that bit there, but I think we do need a lot more engagement with our stakeholders. Um, Jane, I think maybe if I can be on her side a bit, I think the reason why the question was to you is because it's a global bank and there are some mm -hmm. of these technologies you're already doing in other markets. So you literally have like, you know the way you're told, push the envelope. You have yeah. every right to do so because you've tried and tested elsewhere. And I think uh, the regulator will be more welcoming to you versus entities that are not regulated by them. Yeah, yeah uh, and that's true. And we do have those engagements with our regulator, but it's me and the regulator, not me, ABSA, CBN, <laughs> all of us having the same conversation. And I think that's where she's getting at. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Pauline. Um, but I think it's more of an industry thing as yeah. opposed to us as an individual. But yes, we do have the engagements and we do tell Central Bank, mm -hmm. this is where we are at, this is our strategy, this is where we want to go. Yes. And then we, you know, we walk that journey. Yeah. But then that's me walking that journey alone. You and may not necessarily get everyone, because mm -hmm. remember like when Tessalink was starting and I think only five banks said, hey, let's do it. And they said, we're going to go ahead. Now the rest are queuing and are being told, okay, you need to do this, you need to do this, yet the first ones had the advantage, so 
Please take advantage. <laughs> What's this thing? <laughs> and I think it's catching up with the rest of the world because in other parts of the world, and especially the first countries, there are lobbies, there are people who actually work with regulators to push these agendas. And I, it, like I said, it has to be a very deliberate, intentional effort where it almost comes like from a selfish place where you're pushing it, like we want to do crypto. So how do we align and have the regulator agree with us? So. And it's businesses like you guys. You guys have deeper pockets. You're all over the world. Can lead those conversations. <laughs> Pull a safaricom in who's local and then push these conversations, Deep, right? Deeper pockets indeed. <laughs> to, to answer the question, mm -hmm. um, yes, you can have a line. You can use M-Pesa by itself, but you still need an identifier, and that identifier is mm. a SIM card, and that SIM card has a number. Now, of course, we would rather you use all our three services, <laughs> the data, the voice, and the M-Pesa. But if you insist on using other network, that's okay. M-Pesa, you need a, a number. Um, you could, it is possible to pop it into a tab, and so you could, uh, you could operate your M-Pesa line from maybe a tab. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no restriction. You, you don't have to buy uh, voice minutes for that. All you need is the verification. Um, of that particular number, and you can go ahead. Um, and, and just to update my great, if it's a temporary pay bill, we, we normally do that within 24 hours. You know, because of weddings, funerals, and other special occasions, sometimes people need a temporary pay bill, and that we normally process within 24 hours. Um, but that's for temporary. But then again, I, uh, you need to know people. <laughs> You asked the right person for help. Yeah, to, um, <laughs> just to add to what you said here, yeah, I think also part of the thing you should do is with regulators, as we've seen in other countries, is you must show them the benefits for them to act. Yes. I think that's what most people don't really understand about smart technology, why regulators are always produce, you know, there's a few countries in Africa where they do stuff with regulators now, and it was because we pushed as well, what value do you bring into the regulator first before yourself? Because mm. once he's able to understand the value that you're bringing to them, then it becomes a lot easier for you to have the conversation about your own self. So we went to a regulator in Ethiopia and Zambia, and we, we first talked about what they would benefit. And it took a while, but they got it. Now they're about to implement things that everybody said it was impossible. So I think also kind of looking at how you engage in that conversation rather than saying, do this. No. <laughs> Maybe it is find a problem that they truly have, which that thing can solve for them. Then from there, obviously, you then get yourself a shitty. <laughs> <laughs> Present a win-win situation. I think there's a question here. No, right there, the, behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Meshi. I'm the CIO at Triple OK Law. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one goes out to the entire panel, since we've all mentioned you're using AI in some capacity. How do you remove uh, biases, not just in data, but in the algorithm? Uh, that's one. Second question is uh, directly to Rosie. You mentioned that your data is now anonymized. Is it fully anonymized or is it still anonymized? And if it's fully anonymized, I'm very curious to, know, to understand how the AI is able to connect the dots between two different data sets in order for it to do its decision making. Okay, Thank let's start with you as the rest think of how they're going to answer the first question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, the first one was, okay, should I answer the anonymization? Answer your question first? about anonymization, okay, yes. Cool. <laughs> So, and I hope I'm gonna do the question justice because I don't deal with the data science bit. I open markets, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and give it much um, justice. So essentially what we do is, we do have a, a credit team and we do have a data science team. So when it comes to how we build the policy, how we build the products and everything, the credit team will be able to create, this is what we need or we want the customer, um, the customer who will qualify to fit in. So what the data science team will be able to do is to say all this information is coming into this big um, port of data, but nonetheless it can be retrofitted back into which individual um, is attributed to which particular ID. 
So we do not share with anyone or any individual. No one will have access to see this ID belongs to person X, but you can actually be able to match the data points based on what we're getting, because each, each unique data point is identifiable back to your, to your ID, if you will. Now, one thing we've been able to do today, and we're very excited that we're going to launch it um, in a couple of weeks, due to the fact that we have new, the, the Data Protection Act in Kenya, we're able to uh, do what you call forgetting a customer. So for any user who comes and says, I, and, I, and it's part of the law, so that a customer comes and says, I need you to forget me. We are actually able to track backwards and forget that information for the user. What is still IP is the learnings we get from all the data combined. But for your information tracking backwards, we are actually able to um, forget that information. So we are, we've, we've done quite an extensive exercise on that, and it should be going live, um, I believe, first of December, because we're in the final phases of it. And we're really excited that we are able to fulfill the promise that, one, your data is secure, and two, if you need us to forget you as an individual, we're able to do that. So when you come back again, you will apply afresh. We will start from the beginning. But um, so that's how it works. I don't know whether I'm answering the question fully, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best from <laughs> since I'm not in BS. <laughs> Basically, you expand the data from the system. Yeah. Yes. Apart from now, the, the learnings, the learnings that, or the behaviors that you get from that data. Yeah. So no credit history. Your credit history is gone, or do you still use that? Uh, no, no, so your credit history you is come gone, afresh. But whatever we learned based on your patterns is what we shall keep. But we shall okay. not attribute it back to you. When okay. you come back, you come back as New. an individual. Okay. Yes. But That's you cannot game the system because due to the fact that you have lots of data, your behavior doesn't change. When you come back in, there's some things you will do the same way you <laughs> normally do, and you'll be able to predict so your So you don't think people behavior. can reinvent themselves? <laughs> uh, unless they... I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> All right. I'll, Algorithms I'll, and bias. I'll, Biasness. I'll, I'll pass off my opportunity to talk. <laughs> Actually, it's the AI himself, so I know there's a few more questions. So yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with biased nature? Do you, do, you, do you write programming languages? So what do you use? Is it Python? So in the beginning, when, you, when you're writing a, a programming language, you are the one that is controlling the language to some degree. So if you don't understand the theories of ethical AI from day one, and the theories of ethical data when you use that data to create um, what we call emission control systems, people can, do, can decide to create different types of modules based on exactly what they want the protocol to deliver to them. And most people do that nonstop. So a lot of what we do when we teach people AI is the ethical nature of the data itself and the value between the ethical nature of data and the things that you want to get out of that information. Because if you don't make people understand the potential long-term outcome of an eth unethical way of writing AI programming, everybody will get affected. That's why potentially robots will kill the world, right? We talk about that. So, that is, so we spend a lot of time on ethical AI, and design chips don't really think is a very important issue, but it's an extremely important issue in machine learning, in how you look at data, how you look at the subsets of data, and how you look at the protocols, or you look at the efficiencies you write into the models itself. So when that, when you do that, which means that somebody can't write a program that would change what they want to do, because I can write a program as an AI engineer, even though they say they do AI, and I can literally change the outcome of all the credit scores. Mm. Technically, I can do that. <laughs> right? Mm. But because if I understand this ethical nature of it, so that's why. And then what do we do for, so for us, in specifically speaking on the healthcare space, we develop our own um, IP, which we call MPON, it's called an MPON theory. And the theory of the MPON is because we take from anonymized data, and we take that data, we create another level of dis non descriptive data. And at that level of non descriptive data, we then break it down into different sets of parts. So each part contains a particular subset of non-descriptive and anonymized data. Mm -hmm. And when you map it together, it gives you an understanding of what the potential in the future could be. So which obviously means that data is also unhackable because you can only hack one part. Even if you hack one part, the other ones will automatically begin to automate the system. 
Yeah. So that is our own particular IP that we develop. We use a combination of blockchain and AI to develop our own endpoint here. And that is what we use to say anything. When we secure the data, it allows us to say, yes, that data is truly immutable. So I can share more about our architecture of the endpoint here. All right. He is passionate. Can you feel and hear the passionate? He can actually have a, you have a whole session on a class on AI and encryption and all those, so find him. And unfortunately, time is up. I know this was one of the juiciest sessions you've had here. So please, a big hand of applause for my panelists. <laughs> this is a good time to tweet. Share something you've learned. Um, redirect people to the Safaricom PLC page to retweet. So again, thank you. And I'll hand it over back to the MC. Just say one thing. Yes. OK, just like just 30 seconds. seconds. I think it's really important that we kind of look at where Africa is at this minute, and we understand that the future of this continent is really in the mind of the individual. In each person's mind lies the future, because the future that we're talking about is actually happening around us at this minute. And all those smart technologies combine to determine how we use that future for now. It's not tomorrow. It's not going to happen the day after tomorrow. It's happening right around you. But the whole concept of it is in your mind. The way you re-engineer your mind is how the future will pronounce itself. All right, and food for thought. A big hand of applause for John. Exactly. All right, thank you all very much. Over to you.